for the 1991 National Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions. This is far and away the longest running boxing show in America. Now in its 68th year, it dates back to 1923. Hello again, everyone. I'm Sam Nover. You know, back in 1976, 10 of the 11 members of the U.S. Olympic boxing team were products of Golden Glove tournament activity. That is not to suggest that in our next Olympic year, 1992, that many will be represented from Golden Gloves, but we do believe we have a wonderful array of talent for you tonight. To tell you more about that, meet my partner, Van Stokes. Van? Sam, this really has been a spawning grounds for champions. Last year alone, three products from this competition went on to win USA ABF Open Championships and the Open Championships held just this past spring. One of those boxers we'll see tonight. Timothy Austin, 20 years of age from Cincinnati, Ohio, defending 112 pound champion. Right now, Timothy Austin is in lane one to win a berth on the USA team in the 1992 Olympics. Timothy Austin's opponent tonight will be Russell Roberts. Russell will be coming from New Orleans. He's also a defending champion, but in the 106-pound category, boxing up this year in the 112. It should be an interesting matchup. Van, you and I, of course, had the pleasure of doing last year's event in Miami, and the young man we were most impressed with is back to defend his championship this year. Tell our viewers about Jeremy, will you? Well, Sam, first of all, it's very hard not to be impressed with Jeremy Williams. Jeremy Williams is perhaps the power puncher of the tournament. 18 years of age, but a real veteran. His first setback came last summer when he lost to the Soviet world champion Andre Kurnioff in the Goodwill Games. But he rebounded, came back, and beat Kurnioff in the fall before losing to another Soviet opponent just this past spring. His opponent tonight, John Ruiz. Ruiz is in for one tough bout because Williams is one tough boxer. Okay, those are just two of the 24 boxers you'll get a chance to see tonight. We think we've got a great show for you. Stay tuned. We'll be back with our first bout. The gentlemen are, are some Des Moines businessmen uh, who are dressed tonight, as you can well see, in Don King wigs. There are about 20 of these guys who are very prominent businessmen in this area, and they uh, donate a great deal of money to charity as a result of their boxing endeavors. I'm told, in fact, Van, that they wager on each of these fights, and the guy who wins the bets has to donate all of the winnings to his favorite charity. With Louisiana, 18-year-old Russell Roberts. He's had over 200 amateur bouts, and his opponent, 20-year-old Timmy Austin, the defending champion at 112 pounds, Young man back to defend his crown out of Cincinnati, Ohio, and a very impressive youngster indeed. Now let's move ahead to some action in the third round. Well, Timmy Austin certainly could walk into one. If he doesn't walk into one and get decked, then it's up to Russell Roberts to be such an aggressor in this particular round that uh, he's going to come out. But that's going to be a difficult task. And, Mike, we hasten to add that Russell Roberts won his four previous bouts this week. Uh, in very impressive style. In two of them, the referee stopped the contest. In the two that went to a decision, he won by scores of five to nothing. So, and again, Austin lands again a telling blow. Doesn't mean anything more than a jab, I hasten to point out, but Austin in full control of this bout. But the protective headgear, the safety devices that we mentioned earlier, Sam, Russell Roberts is not hurt. He's, he's been on the receiving end of several scoring blows, but he is not hurt in that ring. You know, I enjoyed uh, Timmy Austin when he came back to the corner. He came back smiling. His coach, uh, Mazan Kemp, uh, saw that smile and says, you're having fun. Just keep it up. Keep him away from you. Keep the distance out there. He's got the good reach. And sometimes the southpaw style is confusing. I don't know how many Roberts has faced. But uh, it's obviously much rarer than conventional right-hander. Again, Austin with three or four unanswered punches from Roberts. Roberts just has to realize he's going up against one of the best boxers we got right now in the lower weight classes here in America. The best boxer, perhaps, pound for pound in the United States program, Eric Griffin from the 106-pound category, current defending world champion. But this is a really great combo with Griffin at 106 and Austin at 112. And if you're out there projecting Timmy Austin as your possible U.S. Olympic uh, representative, 112, pounds uh, know that this young man has been very impressive in inter international competition on three occasions he has beaten the Soviet boxers uh, considered to be obviously every bit the uh, the US equals if not better in some cases. And, and that's what I like about him Sam he comes on through the Golden Gloves he started boxing in the Junior Olympics in 1986 and so what we've seen is growth development and maturity to the point where now at 20 years of age he's a world-class performer absolutely 45 seconds to go in this one. 
And so far it has belonged wholly to Timmy Austin. Certainly not because of anything Russell Roberts did wrong. I think he simply was overmatched here. But it was a great learning experience and will be for Roberts, who at 18 years old, two years younger than Austin, obviously, has represented himself very well, having won at 106 pounds last year, stepping up and finding it a bit more difficult now when you step into the ring with Ter Timmy Austin. Well, as this bout does wind down, Sam, I do have to credit Russell Roberts. He's hung with Timmy Austin as best he can this entire bout. And the bell, and that'll do it. And a great round of applause here from the appreciative crowd in Des Moines, Iowa. Dan, I think we ought to clear up the difference in the rules between uh, amateur boxing and pro boxing. Our viewers who are watching uh, this kind of competition for the first time need to be reminded of these very important points. Well, this tournament, Sam, will be following basic international amateur rules. There will be three three-minute rounds with a one-minute rest period in between rounds. We'll be using a five-judge system in the tournament tonight, and each judge will be using the 20-point must system. What that means is there must be a winner of every round. The winner of every round will receive 20 points, the loser 19, 18, 17 accordingly. Boxers will receive a standing eight count. That's primarily for safety purposes. Three eight counts in one round and four in the bout. The bout is over. Be administered warnings for fouls, all sorts of fouls, again, to keep it clean. Safety equipment tonight to be used, protective headgear, mouthpiece, and protective groin protector. And the winner of this box, fighting out of the blue corner from Cincinnati, Terry Austin. Extremely gifted, extremely confident young man, 20-year-old Timmy Austin. And you keep an eye on him because in about a year from now, he may very well be the United States Olympic team representative at 112 pounds, man. Could very easily be. Right now, I say he's in lane number one, but there's a lot of water to go over the dam between now and 1992. At 106 pounds, the finalists were Danny Davis out of Philadelphia and Brett Corbett, the 16-year-old youngster from Granville, New York. And Van, to be perfectly honest with our viewers, uh, this was not a particularly popular decision. We'll show you some action here from round number two. It's Corbett on your left and Davis on the right. It's a case where Davis came out early, popped with the left, found a home for the right, and stayed in there. Corbett seemed to deliver, but he gave up too much, took too much in return, subsequently came out on the losing end. And the winner at 106 pounds, 23-year-old Danny Davis from 19 pounds from Baker, Louisiana. 21-year-old Aristed Clayton Jr., who has been in these charted waters before, fought for the national championship with the Golden Gloves last year and lost. And his opponent, 20-year-old Frankie Gentile from Struthers, Ohio, a young man who's on a boxing scholarship at Northern Michigan University. And uh, this one went right down, we think, Van, to the final seconds before it was decided. I think it went all the way down to round number three. They stood toe-to-toe -to -toe most of the bout. Aristide Clayton tried to use that left. He was particularly effective when he got inside, but Gentile did keep him off balance. Not enough, though. Aristide Clayton came out with the gold. And what a happy young man he is. Aristide Clayton Jr., the winner of the National Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions at 119 pounds. And the finalist at 125 pounds, Freddie Neal, a 20-year-old youngster out of East Cleveland, Ohio. And his opponent, 17-year-old Fernando Sanchez from Las Vegas, Nevada. These two young men met a few months ago. Sanchez, a very easy and very impressive winner over Fred Neal. But it was to be a slightly different story tonight, Van Stokes. Well, he was still a winner, but Neal, who has a come-at-you style and is somewhat of a counterpuncher, just kept on coming at Sanchez. Sanchez, though, was selective, deliberate, landed four scoring blows, and came out the winner. We expect you'll be in for a real treat of this one. 139 pounds. Here are the finalists out of Houston, Texas. 19-year-old Joel Perez. A record of 80 and 11. And his opponent, one of the more gifted boxers in the competition, from St. Louis, Missouri. A bronze medal winner at the Goodwill Games. 22-year-old Teron Millette. Both boxers started early out, feeling each other out. Kind of cautious to begin with, but Perez moved in tight, tagged him with a left, sent a left to the deck. Was a left indeed. We are now back live for round number two, so Millette's been down for a standing eight count, but as Van indicated, he got his head cleared rather quickly and got back into the bow. 
And the knockdown is of no more value than one scoring punch by Millet. So you can win that one back in a hurry. And here comes Millet. Here comes Millet is right. He, he just stunned Joel Perez with a good left of his own. It's the second warning for butting with the head given to Joel Perez. Second caution, I should say. Warning will mean to lose a point. Caution, no points lost. Sometimes it takes a knockdown to wake a boxer up, and I think in Millet's case, uh, that's what's happened here. What I sense is happening right now, Sam, is a healthy respect on the part of each boxer for his opponent. Subsequently, we're seeing some cautious activity or some cautious boxing going on right now. But they've each tagged each other. You gotta love this kid Perez, by the way. I mentioned he was 19 years old. He's raised by his father, a single parent. And uh, he says that the best thing about boxing, when we asked him earlier today, was not any victory, any accomplishment, but the discipline in life that it's taught him. I mean, you just get the feeling, here's a young man who is headed in the right direction no matter what he chooses to do. He's a self-starter. I just, I have to say that about Perez. He likes to read. I said, what do you like to read? He says, Steinbeck, Hemingway, Edgar Allan Poe, Grapes of Wrath, Old Man in the Sea. Good. Great. Midway through the second round and midway through the bout. Ken Weldon, the trainer for Joel Perez. 80 and 11, his amateur record. Weldon cautioning Perez on a low blow, telling him to bring those blows up above the waistline. We're into the final minute, or will be momentarily, of the 139-pound championship bout, the Golden Gloves Tournament here in Des Moines, Iowa. And again, uh, Millet rocked by a good combination from Perez. He's already been down once, has Teron Millet. We've seen more power punches delivered in this particular bout than we have perhaps in some of the other bouts tonight. I wouldn't be surprised to see either one of them go down to the canvas. 30 seconds to go in the second round. Oh. He's a very, it's painful. Very hard punch. In fact, I believe he scored quite well on that last little flurry. And the final 10 seconds of the round coming up, as you can hear the order from uh, referee George Ryder to break, and they do on demand. The Golden Gloves program has sent its fair share of amateur boxers onto the pro ranks. President Ace Miller, an encyclopedia of names of former champions, takes us through some not too ancient history. I just know that it goes back as not to 1934 with Joe Lewis. He was a light heavyweight champion. Ernie Terrell, Sonny Liston. Uh, and the beat goes on, but there's so many guys that don't become champions of the National Golden Gloves that go on to make a lot of money. Joe Frazier fought in there. Uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, as Cassius Clay, was a, was a National Golden Glove champion, a light heavyweight champion. Floyd Patterson fought in the Golden Gloves. Uh, just, I mean, any name that you see out there, you can recognize him as a Golden Glove boxer. He's been there some time. And if ever, Van, we saw a fight where a knockdown was worth no more than one point, it was this one. Perez puts Millette down in the first round, but Millette comes back to win it 5-0 on the scorecards. I have to credit Millette. He got himself together after that early first round knockout, came back out, used his short, compact style, held his gloves into the body, and scored the victory. There's your champion at 139, the Golden Gloves champion, Teron Millette, in a great backward flip. You are looking at Tony Bonsante. He fights in the 147-pound weight class, and he is coming up next. 32 pounds out of Tyler, Texas, attending Northern Michigan University in a boxing scholarship. 24-year-old Larry Nicholson and his opponent, 22-year-old Desi Ford, native of Alliance, Ohio. Young man who uh, won all of his bouts this week on decisions. And guess what, folks? He won a very close one when all of the money was on the line here in the finals at 132 pounds, man. And Larry Nicholson was a very versatile boxer, protected himself quite well, but Desi Ford came out fast, describes himself as sweet, fast, light on his feet, and hard to hit. In fact, just was not hit enough, and the nod did go to Desi Ford. Finalists 156 were Corporal Kevin Bonner from St. Louis, Missouri, but stationed with the U.S. Army at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And his opponent, the uh, granddaddy, the old man in this competition, 26-year-old Leon Richardson, 
still on a boxing scholarship at Northern Michigan University in Marquette. Uh, interesting bout also because it looked to me like uh, Richardson had stolen this one from his busyness, uh, but uh, Van Stokes, the corporal, uh, got his proper due, didn't he? Well, the corporal did. The corporal took a lot of blows. I thought Richardson was methodic throughout. He was good condition. He was always there, but it was never quite enough. And Bonner hung tight, finished every round in good shape, and I think that strong finish on each round is what really turned the judges' eyes. So the corporal Kevin Bonner is the Golden Gloves national champion at 156 pounds, and look at him go. We are at 147 now at the National Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions, and here are the combatants. 20-year-old Tony Bonsante from Crosby, Minnesota. Record of 65 and 15 with 10 KOs. And his opponent, 17 years old, Ross Thompson from Miami, Florida, a member of the Miami Police Boxing Team and it's Sergeant Patrick Burns. You'll learn more about that as we go along. Okay, let's see how it changes now as we move into round number two. They are fighting for the Golden Gloves crown at 147 pounds. Ross Thompson, a most interesting young man. Has as a surrogate father the famed uh, professional boxing referee Richard Steele was living out in Las Vegas. And a uh, little misguided, a little bit misdirected. Oh, and he's landed some telling blows here on Bonsante early in round number two. And Richard uh, recommended that he move to Miami and get some guidance from Patrick Burns. And the sergeant has taken over the uh, sponsorship and the boxing uh, tutelage of young Ross Thompson. And uh, the young man seems to be on the straight and narrow and now getting down to some serious business here in his boxing career as you look at Pat Burns inserted to the right of you on the screen. Pat Burns is uh, probably no one better in Miami or in the southeast and much of the country, as a matter of fact, that can take young people. He seems to find that innate quality. Call it heart, call it whatever you will, Sam. But the people that he has turned out have been fine competitors. Let's give a listen and see if we can't pick up a little bit on what he's saying. He won't be able to say much because you can't shot commands during the round in amateur boxing. That's correct. But you see his lips are moving all the time. He's talking to himself. He's recording those things in his head. See what I'm saying? The kids hold, the kids tying him up. Get this that time. See it? He's tying him up. He's really been working with Ross Thompson, trying to get Ross Thompson to sit down on his punches, maybe get more power underneath him, stay balanced a little bit. What he was looking at there was getting tied up. He doesn't want that to happen. If it happens too much, the referee has to stop and clean it up. We are approaching the final minute of the second round, one in which Ross Thompson has asserted himself. And he continues to be the aggressor. He's got Bonsanti backpedaling a bit here. And Bonsanti, when he backpedals, he is, in fact, tying up Thompson. He's neutralizing that punch, taking that away. When, in fact, that happens and he holds on with the arm, the referee has to say break or stop, whatever it may be. Glancing blow by Thompson off the left side of the face of Bonsanti. Comes Ross back for some more. Hey. Pretty impressive physical specimen, isn't he? Very much so. He's, he's an excellent athlete. He really is. And, and the hey. thing that we talked about, Pat finding not only that innate quality of heart, but he also finds that very talented, uh, talented highly skilled young athlete. And then he holds those skills. About 20 seconds to go in the second round. And if the first one was even, one has to surmise that Thompson uh, has taken uh, a bit of a command here. Uh, but certainly not out of reach for Tony Bonsani, the 20-year-old with his family, rooting feverishly for him here at ringside as we end round two. Now you pay attention. You want to do it your way, you want to do it my way. What do you want to do? Now you pay attention, son. You're getting too wild. You're trying to take him out. Do you understand? This kid has got a head like a brick. You're not going to knock him out. So let's forget the knockout. The name of the game here is points, okay? Points. You don't need to take any risk and start leaping in on top of this kid. What happens every time you get inside? He's holding your arm, right? He's got two warnings for holding your arm. That should tell you something. He's taking away your ability to throw punches. Do you understand? The Golden Gloves organization is made up of individual clubs all across America, and one of the most active and the one run by the police department of that city is the program in Miami. 
Patrick Burns is its founder, and he talks with great pride about Golden Gloves Miami. Well, I've seen guys go on into the military. I see guys now that are in college. I've seen fellas that have $35,000 a year jobs. I see guys uh, getting ready to become a police officer. Um, police officers maybe are going to take over the spot for me when it comes my time to retire. I've seen, uh, I've lost a few. I've had some disappointments. Um, but you can't save the world. But I sure have had an awful lot of nice things happen to me and, and seen an awful lot of good things happen to the kids that stick with the program. Whether they become great boxers or not, they become good young men, good citizens. And might we hasten to add another well-officiated fight by Dan Kelly out of Michigan. You've got some of the finest amateur officials uh, in the country working these Golden Gloves finals. One for each of the 12 final bouts, and Mr. Kelly's distinguished himself, as is everybody else, and so have the fighters, toe-to-toe -to -toe in the middle of the ring. Bonsani's a hard worker. I'll have to credit him with that. He steps inside with all the determination. It's his goal to get off first. He said his best weapon is to stay busy. And you know, he really has stayed busy throughout. Wants to be a football or basketball coach someday, but I can assure you that's down the line. Right now he wants to win a Golden Gloves title and be considered a candidate for the U.S. Olympic team in 1992. Right now what we're watching is age. We're watching the young age of Ross Thompson doing perhaps the things that his coach Patrick Burns does not want him to do. In fact, he's choosing to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tony Bonsante. And it's not going to serve him well. He needs to stick and move. I agree with Pat Burns. Jab and get out of the way. 30 seconds to go on this one, and uh, your guess is as good as ours at this point. Getting a little sloppy at this point, I might add, whether it's fatigue or just off balance, not sitting down on your punches as we spoke earlier, sloppiness is the result. Good finish. They're both very, very busy. Bonsani in the ropes, and here comes Thompson. They are two spent young boxers, I can tell you, as it comes to an end. A lot of activity. National Golden Gloves champion at 147 pounds from Sunshine State in the blue corner, Ross Thompson. Well, happiness is Patrick Burns, Miami boxing team winning themselves another Golden Gloves National Championship. Two last year, one this year in the person of young Ross Thompson. But don't take anything away from a very game Tony Bonsani. What a great kid. Bonsani, a very hard worker, very determined, stayed busy through that, throughout that entire bout. Disappointed, a little dejected at this point. We can understand that. Pat Burns, on the other hand, on Ross Thompson, very elated to have won this bout. And here's the reaction now from the coach of the Miami Police Boxing Team, Patrick Burns. Yes, sir, we've won another. And he catches the boxer in his arms. Very elated, Pat Burns. I heard him say, you win with class and you lose with class. He knew that might have come out on the other side, but very fortunate, very grateful that he came out in Ross Thompson's favor. To the big guys at 165 pounds from Bricktown, New Jersey, 21-year-old Frank Savannah, who, by the way, is quite a PR man working for him all around Des Moines, Iowa this week. And his opponent, 23-year-old Zebedee Coleman from Fort Worth, Texas. Young man who's been boxing for just three years, 17 and 5, with 11 KOs. And our third man in the ring is referee Joe Sanchez out of the state of Ohio. Let's now move ahead to action in the second round. Here we go with round number two. Uh, between rounds there, Frankie Savannah having to listen to his trainer, Bob Van Sickle, questioning whether or not he wanted to be a champion. He did tell Frank, however, that he thought he had won round number one, so let us see. You want to know what? I think I disagree with him. I think Zebedee Coleman may have won round one, 20 to 19. I thought it was close, but that flurry at the end that Coleman caught Savannah with, as well as several other during that bout, I, I thought the tide went in Coleman's favor. And here comes Coleman again. He's, he's absolutely clearly been the aggressor in the bout. He's missed with a lot of wild punches, admittedly, but he's been the aggressor, and he's landed enough that he might very well have stolen round number one. But don't count Savannah out. This young man was uh, named by the New Jersey Hall of Fame as the amateur boxer of the year in 1989. You mentioned you'd seen him in 89. That was just a slip, I believe. Just a slip. Doesn't count anything. Referee wipes off the gloves, and they go back at it. Do right, you want to hear what Savannah does as a hobby? Tell me. He breeds parakeets. 
Reeves parakeet. Do you have any idea of the length of the gestation period of parakeet? I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just going to say wait. four to five weeks, he tells me. I don't wait. believe that. I wouldn't wait. know if he were lying or telling the truth. Reeves parakeet says it. Nice kid, Frankie Savannah, very engaging personality. We enjoyed uh, chatting with him earlier today. Well, if he walks in to the right of Zebedee Coleman, he'll hear bird calls. I'm, I can tell you that. He's got to stay out of the way. I would say Savannah has to be a little more active out there. He styles himself, he calls himself a defense artist. He considers himself a boxer and a puncher. But thus far, he has not put those attributes to work. Van Coleman said earlier today that to win this bout, he felt he had to cut the ring off on Savannah and to be in his face all, all night. Do you feel he's accomplished that goal so far? Boy, good combination, too. Well, you can see for yourself right there, Sam, he is very much going in that direction. I would say right now, definitely, that Zebedee Coleman is fighting his game more than Savannah is fighting his game. Coleman's not cutting the ring out that much, but he is definitely Wait. the aggressor. Under a minute to go in the second round. Referee uh, Joe Sanchez with just a slight caution to... Uh, stop, stop. Another slip. Another slip. He was off balance on that one. I think Savannah's having a tough time staying up with that left hand, that southpaw of Zebedee Coleman. Creating some havoc for him. Very much so. He's, he's having a difficult time adjusting, even though he considers the fact that, that adjusting to his opponent's style is one of his strengths. Thus far, he has not demonstrated that. Savannah with a, a cut on the bridge of the nose, which is not causing him any problem at all. A lot of misses and two good lands by Zebedee Coleman. He has just taken this fight to Frankie Savannah and is going to get out of here perhaps with a lead after two rounds. He might, but I'll tell you, Coleman's hands came down on that particular flurry, and Savannah could, could capitalize on it and go upstairs and hurt Zebedee Coleman. End of two. <laughs> Well, we've talked about Frankie Savannah, the native of Bricktown, New Jersey, and before tonight's bout, we asked him why this championship is so important to him. Because I've had four others, and this is the last one, and I don't know, this would be the perfect ending to uh, my amateur boxing. It's not going to be easy. I'm going to just... I don't know. I'll just, I've been thinking about it a lot, obviously, but... Uh, Got to throw a lot of right hands, make sure you keep the outside of his foot, you know, watch his rushes, you know, he's pretty strong, and uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to just do my best. Looking forward to this one, the final three minutes at 165 pounds, Frankie Savannah on your left, Zebedee Coleman on your right, Coleman at 23, only his fourth year of boxing, but he has shown us some stuff tonight. More importantly, he's shown Savannah a few things. I think he has. He's shown him that right hand, shown him that left hand, shown him away into the ropes once or twice so far during the course of this bout. You know, Coleman's only 23 years old. He's only got 22 bouts to his credit. The nice thing is not burnt out. He's fresh. You can see he's fresh right here. Well, he's landed three or four telling blows on Savannah trying to counter. Uh, but I think it's too little too late for, uh, for Savannah. And I'm saying that with a whole two minutes to go in this round, Van, but uh, Coleman is not deterred. He just continues to forge ahead. Excellent cover by Zebedee Coleman right there. Good defensive movement. Comes back and tries to counter, turn around on the offense. He may be uh, he may be not a real experienced boxer, but I'll tell you, he's done some things very, very well in order to neutralize, in fact, turn the tide against Frank Savannah. Frankie Savannah has been a, uh, a participant in the last three Golden Gloves national tournaments, having qualified from the state of New Jersey. This is the first time he's reached the finals. He'd love to win the granddaddy prize here, uh, but he's got some work to do in the final, uh, let's say, a minute and 40 of the round. You know, Savannah normally has good lateral move, but for some reason or another, he is not moving laterally right now on Zebedee Coleman. In fact, he's standing head-to-head -head with Coleman, and Coleman should best him if that's what they do. Well, I think we nailed this one early. Uh, this is just a case of Savannah not being able to adjust at all to the southpaw style of Coleman, but not only that, but the awkward style, the way he throws his punches, lunging, counter-punching, being very aggressive at times. He doesn't quite know what to expect, what he's going to get out of him. Well, right now, I would say Frankie Savannah has adjusted. But I think it took him a long time in this bout to make this adjustment, Sam. He's got a minute. One minute to go. I would say thus far, he has scored as much, if not more, than Zebedee Coleman in round number three. But as we say, it could be too little, too late. 
Bruins. We're in Des Moines, Iowa. Glad you can join us on ESPN, the National Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions. With Van Stokes, this is Sam Nover, and we hope you're enjoying this uh, quality amateur boxing one year before we send a U.S. Olympic team off to the 1992 Games. And uh, you may be seeing some of these names more prominently displayed in the months ahead as we approach the Olympics. Frank Savannah, we've seen him before in several amateur competitions. Zebedee Coleman, I think we'll see a lot of him down the road. Coleman, at this point, his defense is very ineffective. That might be an understatement, Sam. Yep. Under 10 to go in the round. And the bout. Trading punches at this particular point in time. The question is, how much has been, been traded before now? One of those bouts in which Van Stokes' superiority in the knowledge of boxing won out because it looked to all of us with the layman's eyes if Zebedee Coleman had stolen it. But you warned us at the end that Savannah may have caught the eye of the judges, and indeed he did, Van. He was declared the winner, and after three tries at the National Golden Gloves Championships, Frankie Savannah finally wins the coveted grand prize. You're looking at Jeremy Williams. His fight in the 178-pound weight class is coming up next. You will not want to miss it in the Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions. 178 is the weight classification. The boxer is Jeremy Williams, one of the most Highly touted amateur boxers in all of America. 18 years old, he's a native of Fort Dodge, Iowa. And he is now boxing out of the Croc Gym in Detroit, Michigan. His opponent, 19-year-old Johnny Ruiz from Chelsea, Massachusetts. 25 and one with 18 KOs, but I venture to say that most everybody has come to see Mr. Williams here tonight. Now let's move ahead to some action in the third round. Well, Jeremy Williams up very early here in round three. He did not do much in the second round. And as a result, his uh, trainer, Eddie Carr, got him pumped up off the stool about 15 seconds before the bell that sounded round number three, Van, to really try to get him into this round. Well, he wanted to take a blowtorch and uh, stick it behind him for a while and try to get him fired up. Williams said, I'm ready. I kind of thought he might just come out very aggressive. But you know, he describes his style as being patiently aggressive. I say pacing yourself. But I, I think he can get aggressive. The question is, will it? Jeremy trying to defend the 178-pound title that he won last year in Miami at the National Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions. Kudos, though, to Ruiz. Ruiz is fighting a very smart bout right now. He's staying away from Williams, keeping Williams just a little bit off balance. Williams wants him to come to him so he can hit him hard. Ruiz shouldn't come to him. He can stay in his bout if he stays away. You can see in some of the combinations that Jeremy Williams is just a murderous puncher. He hasn't given us a lot of indication of that tonight. Uh, but you can see in the strength and in the ferocity with which he throws the blows when he does land a few. And again, you can see uh, Eddie Carr inserted, trying with body English to get Jeremy a little bit more aggressive here. About a minute 40 to go in the bout, and Jeremy Williams looking to repeat his champion. John Ruiz trying to pull off the upset of the tournament. Jeremy Williams, the 1989, the 1990 Open champion, the 1990 Golden Gloves champion. The last time he lost to an American, Sam, was in 1987 in the Junior Olympic Championships. All night long. Meantime, lost to two Soviets. But right now, he's not fighting with the flair and the style typical of Jeremy Williams. Overall, he's 50 and two, the two defeats that Van referred to by the Soviets, 43 knockouts. It doesn't look like he'll add one to that collection tonight with only about a minute five to go in the bout. Although he's, he certainly is capable of it with one telling blow. But Ruiz is boxed smartly. Whether he's boxed aggressively enough to steal this title remains to be seen, I would doubt it. Ruiz lost in the first round of the USA ABF Championships a couple of months ago. He has one international bout to his credit, a bout against Sweden, in which he won 2-1 to one against John Peterson in February of this year. And his cornermen trying to get him to be a little bit more aggressive. Jeremy now opening his arms, inviting Ruiz to come in. 30 seconds to go in the bout. Jeremy wants Ruiz to come to him. Ruiz is smart. He's not coming to him. Subsequently, Jeremy can't be effective. A very, very fine job by John Ruiz. Very fine. Did he win the bout? 
Good question. He did a fine job, but I don't know if he did a fine enough job to win, though, Samson. You're down the home stretch now. Ten seconds to go again. Uh, the referee, uh, Deacon Bauer, separating the boxers. Another finely officiated bout. And this one is in the books. If he does win, it'll be a major upset. And uh, Jeremy Williams did what he had to do, not completely to the satisfaction of everybody in attendance who expected him to be Superman tonight, but he won the bout, Van. Williams was frustrated and had great difficulty in connecting with John Ruiz, and that's because Ruiz tried to st stay away from him very successfully. However, it was not successful enough. Williams did manage to come in, find the range enough, mostly on scoring blows to the body, and earn the win. But it was not a convincing power-packed victory like we expected to see. Claiming to be more controlled and disciplined, the winner again this year at 178, Jeremy Williams. Now to the big bombers in the heavyweight division, 23-year-old Austin Thompson out of Ripley, Tennessee, and his opponent, the even younger Melvin Foster at 20 years old. Rounds one and two were not much to watch, but when we got to round three, the action became ferocious. Final three minutes upcoming for the heavyweight championship, and uh, I think referee uh, Ken Butler has sent Foster back to the ring, what, to wipe some of the grease off, some of the moisture around his neck? Wipe off some of that sweat. They're supposed to come out with having the sweat wiped off in between the rounds. Apparently, Foster had uh, not had that done enough. So here we go, and make no mistake about it, this bout will be won in the third round. There is nobody in this ring who has built up a margin large enough that he can coast in the third round. I gave the first round to Melvin Foster 2019, turn around, gave the second round to Austin Thompson 2019. I got it knotted uh, at 39 apiece at the end of round two. It will be decided right here. And again, I caution that Thompson is a young man who really tired in his semifinal bout. And the question here is whether or not he can gather himself enough to box two minutes. And he's doing all right now as he and Foster both demonstrating they want it very badly in the center of the ring. Foster to the body, Thompson to the head. I have to give the edge to Thompson, although I see a little bit of swelling on the left eye of Austin Thompson. Ooh. Foster missed with a wild right. Standing eight count. I guess he didn't miss by much. A standing eight count for Austin Thompson. No, he did not miss there. It connected, in fact, that left eye of Austin Thompson. You can see the referee looking at the eye, trying to determine whether or not to call in the ringside position as he gave the eight count. That's a safety eight count. Chopping right hand by Foster. He is really working inside. Very, very strong. And Thompson just trying to hang in there now. Trying to fight back. Good left jab by Austin. Foster's style is serving him well. He's more of a stand-up man. Straight guy, straight up, stick and move. Not moving effectively, but sticking effectively. Minute 20 to go on the bout. Melvin Foster has seized control, but there's time left for Austin, and here he comes. Oh, oh and another left oh. by Foster, and Thompson's in trouble. Best uppercut I've seen of the night, delivered by Melvin Foster against the head of Austin Thompson. Oh. Thompson taking his second stand this, in eight count. This one's over, thing, I think, right here, Sam. I think this is over. No. He's going to let him continue. Sees that Thompson is in no apparent trouble. If it's going to go any second, you're going to have to watch this one. Referee's going to have to jump in there and grab it. Foster just powerfully with an overhand right, and that's it. Good job. Ken Butler gave Thompson one last chance, and then the right overhand Chopping right hand by Melvin Foster, and Mr. Butler said, I've seen enough. This was like going down a river on a smooth, placid water. And then you get to the waterfall, and it goes 100 miles an hour until it crashes. Unbelievable. Wonderful, wonderful graphic analogy. Where did you get that one from? The referee stops the contest with about 10 seconds to go on the third round, but it was for the safety of Austin Thompson and Melvin Foster has distinguished himself tonight. He is the heavyweight champion of the Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions. The super heavyweights are next as we watch Samson Pua waiting in the wings. We'll be right back to Des Moines, Iowa. Stay with us. For event of the night, usually the super heavyweights, these are the really big bombers. 
You've got a 19-year-old out of Kearns, Utah, born in Long Beach, California, by the name of Samson Puwa, and his opponent only 18 years old. Worcester, Massachusetts is what he calls home, and his name is Bobby Harris, Jr., 45-8, and eight, his record. The Super Heavies, and the crowd has waited with great anticipation for this one. Our third man in the ring, Frank Kelly, the referee. Kelly's going to have his hands full. This is a matchup that involves boxers from different backgrounds, boxers with different styles, and boxers with different body composition. However, both of them are super, heavy, super heavyweights. Who at 220 and Harris at 205. There will be uh, no mistaking which style belongs to which boxer after you watch it for 30 seconds. Pua just a bulk of humanity, a plotter, the aggressor, Harris, the skilled boxer, moves around the ring on the toes, does some dancing. Pua will try to put Harris on the run if he can, and he'll land any punch that he thinks he can. Meanwhile, Harris will stay with that left jab, will continue to circle. It may be effective, but then again, if he circles in the wrong direction, Pua will tag him. And the amazing thing about Sampson is he's only been around here as a boxer, what, since age 15, about four years now? He's, he's only got 22 bouts to his credit. 120 of them. He and Bobby Harris actually are friends. They have never boxed each other, uh, but they are friends and respect each other. And this is always interesting when you put a couple of buddies in the ring against each other. I think they have a very deep uh, respect for each other, and they seem to be different in so many ways, but they have that common mutual respect that binds them together in the sport of boxing. Does friendship sometimes lessen the intensity of a bout band, or does it oftentimes increase the intensity? Uh, I don't think there's such a thing as friendship uh, in between the bells and in between the rings. Oh, Sampson hit him with a good left. He's going to get him over there in the corner. That is not where Harris needs to be. He cannot jab. He cannot move in that corner, and he cannot stand there and let Pua slug at him like that without going down. Pua got him trapped in there and landed some good ones, and then a long right hand caught Bobby Harris on the way out. But Samson Pua taking early control of this bout as we uh, thought that he might. That's about the third or the fourth time that Harris, good right hand by Pua. He's going to apply the pressure now, Sam. 50 seconds to go on the round, and we may not get to the end of it the way Samson Poo is loading up here and delivering on Bobby Harris Jr. Another right hand. Eric, sorry? I was just going to say Harris has really felt the effect of those blows. Uh, he's felt it thus far here in round one. You got two real good kids, and that's not to suggest that anybody else in this competition has not been a good kid. Bobby Harris is a young man who has uh, lost his mother at age 12 and promised her before she passed away that he would dedicate himself to a productive life. He just got a feel for him every step of the way, whatever he does. What a nice young man Harris is. They both are. Harris, though, however, works at the Ionic Avenue Boys and Girls Club. Oh! Before the end of round one, Pua just landing left and right. Pua was very effective in uh, initiating the activity, in fact, cutting the ring off and putting Harris over in the corner, or at least against the ropes. That's where he did most of his scoring. Did this three or four times through the first round. Gained the advantage, first round definitely belonged to Bobby Harris. Now let's move ahead to some action in the third round. Minute 15 to go on this one. Sampson Pua may have taken back whatever momentum he lost in round two from uh, Harris. And Bobby just trying to do what he, what he could do to win this thing. Stay on the outside, get in some scoring blows, and then get away. A lot of affection between these two young men. Love Pua's sense of humor. Asked uh, on his bio today what his hobby was, he said, quote, fighting with my sisters. Can you imagine? You know what he said his best punch was? No. Anything that lands. <laughs> <laughs> That's even better line. But you know, Harris's goal, and we say there's a lot of good things down the road. You take a young guy like Bobby Harris, and he's come through some difficulties with the family, and, and as you indicated, he's just has just done an awful lot with young people. His goal, to have a strong family and a good life. A very admirable goal. And a very simple goal, too. Simple. Pua, oh, Pua hit him good. Right over, uh, right over our uh, broadcast location here, Sampson got Bobby strung over the ropes, landed a couple of uh, combinations. 
This one's about over. And I think Samson Poo is going to be your super heavyweight champion, but I've seen stranger things. We'll see. I do too. Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions, super heavyweight, from Rocky Mountain in the red corner, Samson Puha. Well, Bobby Harris Jr. didn't think so. He Is shook his head no a couple of times. But there wasn't much doubt down at this table at ringside. It was Samson Pua all the way, although Bobby came back and had a pretty decent second round. But that young man has a future in the heavyweight division as a professional super heavyweight as an amateur. He sure does. And we mentioned that we've got a lot of good competitors at the lower weights, but we really need to continue to develop those upper weight classes, and in particular the heavyweight and the super heavyweight. We'll see Samson Pua down the road, Sam. Gloves Tournament of Champions. They select an outstanding boxer award at the end of every year. And this year it has gone to the 139 pound champion, Teron Millette of St. Louis, Missouri. Welcome back to the Veterans Memorial Auditorium here in Des Moines, Iowa. We set this evening up for you with a couple of young men who we expected to be champions. Uh, Timmy Austin was a wonderful performer tonight. Jeremy Williams trying to repeat at 178. Our expectations for Williams are always so great, Van, that anything shy of a knockout is a disappointment. But give me an evaluation in your words of these two young men. Well, first of all, Timmy Austin came out in great shape. He won convincingly against Russell Roberts. Did it perhaps with the 2018, 2018, and then again a 2018 round in the third round to take that title against, uh, defend that title, I might say, at 112 pounds. On the other hand, Jeremy Williams, Johnny Ruiz kept him off balance, frustrated him, and we didn't get a chance to see Jeremy Williams do what he can do best, and that's hit and hit with power. Still, we saw Jim Jeremy Williams win the bout tonight. Well, we'll be Hi, everyone from Des Moines, Iowa. A special thanks to John Van Sickler, Mary Pruitt, and Linda Johnson who did so much in helping us prepare for our broadcast of the National Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions. The 1991 Golden Gloves National